Thank you so much, Anne, for that great presentation, and Chris to you as well. So it looks like we have a couple of questions regarding whether this presentation is going to be available later today. The answer to everyone who's been wondering that is the answer is yes. We will be sending along a recording of this webinar. Um, but let me address some questions that we have from the crowd. Um, Chris or Ann, you can both take these questions. Um, I'll leave it up to you both. Uh, the first question we have is, how are community, para community paramedicine programs subsidized? I can take that one. Um, currently, we're seeing them subsidized in various different ways. We are seeing them initially to be grant funded, but more and more every day, we're seeing that once there is the established provider within the healthcare system of a community paramedic, and that is usually done through changing through legislation or through rules or regulations, then that provider can be reimbursed. Right now, a lot of the programs are going to their payers at the state level and local level to say, we can provide X service what and then negotiating what that reimbursement would be. So they are being reimbursed by um, private and public payers at the state level. Now that's evolving, that's different states at state to state, but I think that's part of this push with ET3 is to have the insurance companies start thinking about different ways to be, for the programs to be reimbursed. Gotcha, and thank you so much for that answer. And you know, in your experience, Anne, how long do you think it takes for communities to really latch on to the community paramedicine model? Um, do you find that patients and EMS staff easily adopt to this, or would you say that there's a big learning curve involved? I would say definitely there is a learning curve. Um, in a community, let's start at the community level. Um, I think some of the healthcare providers aren't familiar or haven't worked alongside paramedics on a regular basis. They're used to the paramedics just bringing the patients to the ED and then not following up afterwards. So to get that buy-in and that support is really crucial, and that's why that engagement piece is so important. It can sometimes take you 5, 10, 20, 50 times going to a practice or meeting with a provider for them to finally get it how impactful the community paramedic can be if they work together with them. Now, there can be some practices or some physicians that get it right away, but it can take years for others. But finally, when they do get it, your floodgates will be opened. Now, internally, I'll say that not every paramedic or EMT within your organization will want to be a community paramedic. Now, if you initially ask students that are just starting paramedic school, they'll say they're very far from ever thinking about wanting to be a community paramedic, and they're in it for the adrenaline and the lights and sirens. But as we advance paramedicine in the United States and the opportunities for career ladders, different um, shifts, different ways of managing our patients, we're seeing more and more buy-in um, for that. Gotcha. And another question we have is, if repeat patients are used to being transported to the emergency department every time they call, are you seeing that these patients are a little bit unnerved when an EMS recommends or starts a community paramedicine program um, and they offer to treat them at home instead? Is there a level of skepticism um, involved you know, among patients and how do you convince, convince them that they're getting just as equally as great care as they would do in the ED? So I think initially they're like, well, you, that's, I mean, it's a great question. I think initially they, they push back saying, well, but the only way to get care is going to the ED. So really sitting down with the patient and saying, you know, I wanna hook you up with our community paramedics. They're gonna to come to your home. They're gonna spend time with you. They're gonna figure out what's needed. They're gonna link you to resources. They're gonna get you the medications you need. They're gonna help you figure out a way to um, get into primary care physician so you can be managed in a non-emergent way. Usually by the end of it, they're so thankful to have another system where they're not sitting in the ED for eight hours to be seen and follow-up care and all in their home. 
Um, also, the community paramedics are great at being in the home and identifying other things that are going on that even the primary care can't see in the office. So being able to link those needs back and forth, the patients that I have seen and that I've heard about are very, very grateful. And this is mm -hmm. Chris. Yes. One of your one of your examples was a community paramedic who came in who was transporting a diabetic patient routinely to the hospital. And because they were in the house, they were able to identify um, yes. or or realize identifiers that forever changed the care for that patient. Can you share that story? Yes, I would love to. So there was a story where we had where I heard about a patient that never called 911 and then all of a sudden was calling 911 one or two or three times a week to be transported to the ED. This is a fully functioning 50-year-old um, working and then all of a sudden their diabetes was out of control. So the primary care asked the community parent to go into the home and really get down to what was happening. Well, what happened is because, well, no, they, because their insurance company changed the type of is insulin they were going to reimburse for, they had to change so to ensure that the medication would be paid for. But the change made an impact on how the diabetes was being managed. So it took the community paramedic going into the home, really sitting down and talking with them to find out what had happened. And that was where the disconnect occurred. It didn't even occur to the primary care because it was just what was up on the list to be checked, to be ordered because it was on the formulary for to be reimbursed. But then the community paramedic took it even further. They went in and with the physician, wrote to the insurance company outlining the need, showing how many times they called 911, how many times they were transported, how many missed hours of work they had, and convinced the insurance company to make an exception and allow them to switch back to their original insulin at the same reimbursement. So it goes to kind of show that if they hadn't gone into the home or if they hadn't taken the time to do that, that they, that who knows what would have happened with that patient. But because of those interventions being so impactful, the patient is now not calling 911 and everything else is um, on the right track. Gotcha, and what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions that patients have about community paramedicine programs if they have heard of it? I think the patient's biggest misconception is first, what is it going to cost? Um, I don't want a big um, ambulance sitting outside of my house. Um, we have found that when community paramedics come in a large fire truck or an ambulance, the neighbors are worried that there's something else going on with the patient. So a lot of the programs have adjusted with um, driving a different type of um, vehicle. Um, and I think just not understanding really what a paramedic can do in the first place. I think they think they can just treat emergencies. And so being able to sit down with them and help them out kind of um, soothes some of those concerns and some of those worries. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And it looks like we have time for just one more question. Um, that question being, have you seen pushback from hospitals about CP programs? For instance, are they upset with decreased patient volume or relieved, or really, are they relieved by having less crowded emergency departments? What do you think? Great question. I'm seeing both. I think at first, hospitals were worried that their highest cost center and revenue generator were now decreasing the patient volume, but then they realized some of those patients are the patients slipping through the gaps that may not have insurance or have high deductibles and aren't paying them anyway. And then they're occupying their beds. Then on the flip side, I have hospitals, I see hospitals calling up paramedic services saying, I heard about this community paramedic thing. You guys need to start it right away. And um, the service is like, but first we have to put them through the right education. We can't just start it without doing all these appropriate steps. So I've seen it on both sides on the flip side. Um, I was just in a hospital lap two weeks ago in rural um, Montana, and I, we were implementing Pulsera, and the ED manager said, oh, I'm so excited. Guess what? We're also implementing this community paramedic thing. 
And I'm like, oh, really? That's awesome. And she said, yeah, we heard about it. So we went to our EMS agency and we're working together to implement this in this rural area. And they're looking, you know, at the ways they can meet those needs. But it was neat to see that being brought up from the hospital's point of view and just even the rural areas. 